Hi, I'm Annette and I'm so glad you've joined us again for the second episode of the Queensland Rail History Podcast. Our podcast is all about discovering the story of the railways across our state and how they evolved and the hardworking people who created them. If you haven't listened to our first episode yet, please go back and give it a listen. We chat through the beginnings of Queensland Railways and where it all began in Ipswich. In this two-part episode, we're going to dive into one of the most iconic pieces of railway in Australia, arguably in the world, the Coranda Scenic Railway, the KSR, located in far north Queensland. It has become such a popular tourist attraction in Cairns, truly a must-see experience. We'll chat with our historian, Greg, and deep dive into how the railway came to exist, and we'll also talk with a train driver with over 25 years experience driving on the Coranda Range. Going up the Coranda Range was beautiful. Just the power of that barren falls, the water roaring over there and smashing down that thousand foot drop. You can feel it rumbling. I said, I loved it and I thought it was great. Rising from sea level to 327 metres, the journey to Coranda passes through flat farm fields outside of Cairns, heading up through a dense World Heritage listed rainforest, winding through man-made tunnels, over the Barren Gorge and over towering bridges, passing spectacular waterfalls along the way. This year also marks the 130th anniversary since the Coranda Scenic Railway was opened. But how did this railway get built? And why did it get built? To find out, we have gone back to 1875, when traceable measures of tin were found in a small town in far north Queensland. Be that as it may, we, in common with the whole community, hail with pleasure the inauguration of the railway in Queensland. An old woman in our carriage was very proud of this little bit of railroad. With me today, we have our historian, Greg Hallam. Greg, I've heard you've been with the Queensland Railway for 21 years today. Congratulations. Thank you, Annette. Yeah, 21 years with QR and uh, three generations in the railway. But um, as I said, I'm still learning lots of things every day, even in the role as a historian. I'm joining you via the clouds today, or rather the cloud. Yes. Where are we recording today, you ask? Remotely from Toowoomba and here in Brisbane. We'll see how it goes today. I found this remarkable quote in a tourism guidebook that was published in 1914. Margaret Clow wrote about the walks around the Barren Gorge and where to stay, etc. If memory serves me correct, I think she was a school mum. It was later republished and rediscovered some of the old walks, etc. in the Barren Falls National Park. The quote, I think, nicely links the story of the railway, tourism, and the attraction of the Barren Falls nearly 110 years ago now. This is what Margaret wrote. It's It's a a Friday Friday afternoon. afternoon. The 245 train steams into Coranda Station. It is boarded by 20 visitors who hold tickets for the mile and a half journey to the falls. No need to designate them. They are the falls. A bell rings. A door bangs, the engine emits a shrill whistle and the train is off. The journey to the falls is very short. Stepping out of the train, we 20 travellers, most of whom have come 2,000 or more miles to see what may justly be termed nature's masterpiece in Australia. That lovely little book was called The Mecca of Our Desires, Miranda in the Famous Barren Falls, and that was by Margaret Clay and it was published in 1914. So to go back a little bit in that story, Annette, about 100 kilometres southwest of Cairns is a rural town called Herberton. Discovery of Tim proved to be sufficiently profitable in that era to warrant a railway, but Herberton was located about 882 metres above sea level, and therefore making the construction of any railway difficult. In common with building a railway anywhere, uh, Annette, there's always rivalries. There's always someone wanting a railway, because the railway in the 19th century brought success, it brought prosperity. But whoever got the railway generally remained. Those who didn't get the railway, they lost out. So there were three rival uh, northern townships that um, were looking to be the outlet point for the railway. So you had Marillion Harbour, there was Cairns and also Port Douglas. And each one of these three, they were all vying to be the port for those lucrative tin fields. 
It was actually a, um, a ride or a pack ride that had actually been constructed from Port Douglas. They called it the Bump Road and it came up from Port Douglas. And actually, it provided the best access to the tin fields and it was far easier than an alternative pack track from Cairns. Cairns had been proclaimed a port in October of 1876 and it actually provided a shorter route to the Hodgkinson gold fields than even from Cooktown. So at this stage, in the, that part of the 19th century, it was all about metals, it was about tin, and it was about gold if you're inland from Cooktown on the Laura and the uh, Palmer River, uh, those areas. But the difficulties of crossing the coastal range meant that with the establishment of Port Douglas, with its much easier track to the Hodgson Goldfield, Cairns decreased in importance. Now the wet season of 1882, it was really the litmus test, I'd suppose you'd say, Annette, because it showed how urgent the need was for reliable transport of life's necessities and into the area, as well as movement of mineral production out to a coastal port. There were desperate tin miners on the uh, Herbert and Fields, and they were unable to obtain supplies, and actually they were even on the verge of famine. I mean, that was how difficult conditions were for the miners there. The boggy road that led inland from Port Douglas was actually proving impassable. And so as a result, the settlers at Herbiton raised very loud and very angry voices and they began agitation for a railway to the coast. And in that era, everyone wanted a railway because, again, with a railway, not only did it bring permanency, but it brought reliable transport as well. So as a result, he raised angry voices and agitation to Parliament. The region to the west of this part of Queensland was very rugged and was including mountainous rainforest. It was some of the most difficult landscape that you'd actually conceive of building a railway into. So in February of 1882, both Port Douglas and Cairns formed railway leagues, as they did in those days, and they engaged in a long and very, very bitter fight for the right to be the railway and actually to be the port. So actually to bring in the miners and to take the tin and whatever comes in from the hinterland out to sea. Not long after that, Geraldton, which was later renamed Innisfail, it ended the competition as well. So you got these uh, townships, you got these uh, small ports, you got these people literally fighting with each other because all wanted the railway. They wanted to be the railway point, they wanted to be the terminus or the beginning of the railway, whichever way you looked at it. So in March of 1882, the Minister for Works and Mines, Mr Macrossan, uh, there's actually um, a, bridge, a railway bridge in North Queensland called the Macrossan Bridge and that's on the Burdekin River, if memory serves me correct. He announced a route for a railway from the Atherton Tablelands to the coast. He commissioned Christy Palmerston, who was an expert bushman in North Queensland, and he was an incredibly colourful pioneer in character to find a suitable route. So during the year, Palmerston, he marked out several possible routes from the coast. Uh, there was inland along the Mossman River. There was the Barren Gorge, or the Barren Valley up from Cairns. There was also the Mulgrave Valley. And in November of 1882, Palmerston made the trip from Marillion to Herbiton in nine days and he repeatedly came across the tract which an inspector Douglas had marked previously. So they used to do in that era, whenever they go out, surveyors, um, uh, they go out, they blaze trees, they put marks basically to indicate uh, uh, when they took surveys and things like that. So Palmerston was pushing his way through, you know, this uh, incredibly rugged countryside and rainforest and then comes across my track. Uh, You'd come across blaze trees and marks like that had been left by uh, previous people who'd been that way or surveyors. So in March of 1884, there was a surveyor named Monk. So now a Monk enters the story. He submitted reports from investigations that were carried out on all the routes that had been marked by Christy Palmerston. Now the Barren Valley Gorge or the, uh, was the route that was ultimately chosen. And so after two years of railway survey, the government announced on the 10th of September 1884 that it had chosen Cairns. It was considered the better port, and then three surveyors come into it. So we've got surveyor Stewart, Amos, and Monk. They considered that what they called the precipitous slopes of the Barren Gorge that offered a better route than railway lines coming up from Port Douglas or up the Mulgrave Valley. Now, the survey of the Cairns to Coranda Railway commenced under Robert Ballard, uh, who was at that stage chief engineer of the Central and Northern Division of the Queensland Railways. I'll just digress for a little minute. Ballard is a very interesting character. When we talk about the railway being built up uh, to the main range here in Toowoomba in the 1860s, Ballard was the engineer in chief. He actually was 25 years old. He was in charge of the heavy works coming up the Toowoomba range, which includes the tunnels that are still there today from the 1860s. He was actually responsible for a workforce of about 1,500 at that stage, and he was a 25-year-old um, engineer. And Ballard actually remained in the railway story of Queensland until the uh, 1880s. 
if you look in the railway history of Queensland, you'll find Bellard popping up a lot. And up here in Toowoomba, it's actually a suburb named after Bellard. You have Fitzgibbon down in Brisbane after Abram Fitzgibbon. We've got Bellard up here named after Robert Bellard. So back to the story. So uh, Bellard, he was then the chief engineer of the Central and Northern Division of the Queensland Railways. The remainder of the survey, and the design and works, and the majority of the supervision, it was actually taken over by Willoughby Henham, who was chief engineer of the Northern Division of the Queensland Government Railways. And if memory serves me again, I think there's a Henham's Gap, which is at the uh, top of the climb um, when you come up the Drummond Range, which is between uh, Bogan Tungan and Alpha on the central line. I was going to say, I love it. It's um, They really shaped Queensland. They did too. So these people who worked on our railways were so honoured and had such a big input into our lives that they've been honoured with towns named after them and gaps and <laughs> amazing things. To think they were just going to work every day, yeah. but they were making a difference. I think that's an interesting thing because, you know, the legacy of the railway, you know, it's not only much about, you know, iron and steel and things like that. It is about people as well, you know. You never know, maybe in 100 years there'll be an in it something or other, you know, remarking, remarking on our podcasts and things like that, anything. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so will it be Henham? So, uh, yeah, if you go on the Spirit of the Outback, you go through Henham's Gap, and uh, that's named after Willoughby Henham. Anyway, the storm of indignation which followed from Port Douglas and Geraldton, it was enormous. And uh, mind you, Cairns was celebrating. They were jubilant because they got the railway. And the Queensland Parliament, they actually approved the plans on the 30th of October, 1885, they awarded the first contract, ironically, on the 1st of April of 1886. I just, I think that's really interesting too, Greg, because the miners had nearly famished in 1882, but it still took them another four years before they even awarded a contract. Yeah, well, that's the thing with the railway in this era. It wasn't something you just, uh, you know, wave a magic wand at, you know, if you're the sorcerer's apprentice or something like that. Building a railway was basically based on legislation and it's based on, you know, it's based on economics, it's based on money. Um, as you saw in the history of Queensland, it was based on, you know, po political matters as well because, you know, the government was, it was a government railway. But it did take time, but I think it also indicates, like, this was an extremely difficult railway for the colony to build. It was going to be expensive and it was going to require a lot of engineering uh, works uh, to be involved in it. And this is, again, similar to building the railway here in the 1860s. So much had to be imported for the railway, you know, to actually construct our first railway line. Um, 30 years on, you know, when you're looking at it, the story hasn't changed too much, you know, 25, 30 years on. Construction of the Cairns to Coranda Railway was an engineering feat of tremendous magnitude. This enthralling chapter in the history of Northern Queensland stands as testimony to the splendid ambitions, fortitude and suffering of the hundreds of men engaged in its construction. It also stands as a monument to the many men who lost their lives on the amazing project. Someone who is passionate about the Coranda Railway line is Sean Robluski. Sean is third generation in the railway and started at Queensland Rail in 1973 at the age of 15. Working his way up through the ranks, Sean is currently driver in charge, overseeing all the train drivers operating in Cairns. He first experienced the Coranda line while training as a guard, before returning there as a train driver in 1995. So when I come back, when I come back and you first go back up there after you've been away eight or nine years, it's just you appreciate how beautiful and so exquisite that range is and the heritage is just pouring out of it. When I was full-time driver, um, I used to love going up that range because the scenery is fantastic, the, just the smell of the rainforest, you know, it's just absolutely beautiful. When you go up around places like Stony Creek and you look back and you watch the train going around the tight corner there curve and you see Stony Creek Falls behind it, looks absolutely magnificent. You're coming around the edge of the um, glacier rock as well. When you come around the corner of the mountain, you look out and you can see right out to Green Island, you can see all the cans, all the, um, the, the bay and everything. And it's just so breathtaking. And, and that's what I used to say to people I've got um, relatives down south and friends, so I'd say, well, I get paid to do this, and I love it. I mean, I just it's just a different view every day. Some days it's clear, some days it's stormy, some days it's cloudy, rainy, just every day is different, and that's why I, I love driving up there and appreciate it. 
It's beautiful, magnificent. I know there are quite a few of our listeners out here, they love their statistics and things like that. We had to look into it uh, and we came up, well, on the line, there's 106 cuttings. There's 15 tunnels that total 1,746 metres in total length. There's 244 metres of steel bridge spans. There's 1,894 metres of timber bridges. The side slopes of the gorge are between 40 degrees and 50 degrees. So that's 45 degrees to the vertical to 50 degrees. That's very, very steep. And that's the side of the uh, gorge that you go and build your railway up to. And uh, basically it also made, that once you started clearing all the vegetation back, it made for a lot of loose material, made for a lot of scree, and also would make uh, ultimately for what could be, you know, very dangerous conditions, you know, for, as you decide to build the railway. Can I digress for a second? Of course you can. What is scree? Scree, excellent. Scree is um, loose rock that comes up on the slopes of uh, hillsides and things like that and mountain. It's loose rock, so it's not uh, basically that's held in uh, by um, vegetation, and it's loose, which means it's like rubble, which means it moves in its fall. And if you ever come up to um, Toowoomba, you come up through the Murphy's Creek Road, which brings you up through Ballard and uh, brings you up to Blue Mountains Heights. When you're coming up uh, towards uh, where the Spring Bluff turnoff is, if you look to your left, there's a hill up there or a mountain, um, and it's called Ben Lomond. And if you have a look on that mountainside, it's volcanic scree. And virtually it's, an, it's a continual landslide, very, very slow, but it's just a volcanic rock and it's continually moving. And it's a remarkable thing. It's one of the reasons why when they built the railway here, an easier way would have been gone to the left of the, um, basically to the left of the valley that they come up, but they couldn't because of all the volcanic scree on uh, Ben Lomond. So I went to the right, which brings you up around Spring Bluff and that, and it took longer to get up the hill anyway. And it, I think... According to one engineering analysis, it's believed to be uniquely uh, steeper and looser than any other mountain railway in Australia. The mountain railways in Australia, you think of the ones uh, to the Adelaide Hills, um, to Toowoomba, the Blue Mountains line, and there's a couple of other mountain railways. But again, this is unique in its construction. It was also unique, basically, in its entire, well, there's no two ways about it, in the entire idea that went behind its construction. So those first 39 kilometres of track, as we said, are approved by Parliament on the 30th of October 1885. The contract was provided to a Mr P Smith on the 1st of April 1886, uh, but that was only for the first third of the distance going up the gorge. I think the other thing too is because of the conditions that they're building into, so this is the wet season in North Queensland, we're talking about cyclones and, all, and uh, everything that goes with the wet season in that part of Queensland, there was also delays in getting everything needed to construct the railway. So that's delays in ironwork, uh, steelwork, bridge work, but it was also the delay of the actual rails that were going to be laid. And uh, because of that delay that were getting shipped in from overseas, it actually delayed the initial works until well into the wet season of that year. Um, and the workforce, there was sickness involved and any railway in Queens, uh, one of the interesting things when they talk about railway construction, one of the things is that the stories of sickness that came up. Because in the 19th century, there were the big day, there were diseases. There was cholera, um, which was um, in many of the camps here. You read of uh, inquests from the 1860s through, and there's talk about uh, diphtheria. Um, there's croup, you know, for children, whooping cough. There's actually even dengue. There was a form of dengue and malaria. So this is parts of Queensland that had malaria in them. Um, so when they talk about this construction, they're talking about sickness. We're talking about people, uh, Europeans, who are building railway into rainforest, into tropical rainforest, and the sickness that they would encounter. And they'd come from anything. And they'd be from, um, well, from any tropical disease or even come from ticks, typhus, those sorts of things in there. So these workmen, they didn't take their families up on these one, did they? So we've seen in, from when we were talking about it switched to Grantchester, they were taking their families along. But they weren't having their families on the side of this mountain, were they? It was quite often in railway construction works in Australia from the 1860s and even into the early 20th century, families did reside with the workers in the camps, you know, they were um, navy camps and construction camps. I think the other interesting thing that went with it with the families, well, there was basically a, an intention that, you know, families would uh, reside with the workers. And just to backtrack a little, when you're talking about those early years here in the 1860s, 
if memory serves me correct, about a third of those who came to build the railways in the 1860s with their families, about a third of them were married. They used to have about five or six children as well. But this one was a bit different because the Cairns Coranda with the railway construction workers, it tend to be a lot of uh, well, you know, employed men who were employed for it and it was their role uh, to do the work. So it wasn't so much big families as in, the, say, the generation before where the railway works were different. This was a much tougher environment and uh, living conditions were pretty tough and pretty tied up there in it. So. Yeah, that's why I thought they couldn't have their families up there with them on this one. You wouldn't want your family living on 40 or 50 degree <laughs> slopes. <laughs> Well, that's exactly right, yeah. Tough conditions, tough people as they say, you know. Because it was so difficult then, the contractors actually threw up the work. What do you mean by they threw up the work? Uh, yeah, okay. Not the one that you're probably thinking about, but basically threw up was, um, it's a good question because the work was deemed too difficult by the contractors. Uh, what they tended for the price and what they anticipated constructing the work for, the difficulties were too great for them. So they literally said, we can't do this. So they threw up the work as the... Um, uh, as they said in that era. So they had to go back basically to other tenderers or other people who would be prepared to take on the work. It was taken over by McBride and Co. And actually, because of the difficulties involved, you know, for the contractors, the work was actually finished by the Queensland government. They'd actually come in, took over the works themselves because of the difficulties involved and the problems the contractors were having in that. And eventually they took over and they finished it up themselves. So that first section, anyhow, it was officially opened on the 8th of October of 1887. It taken about 18 months to finish about 10 miles of railway, which is probably in the modern currency there, you're looking at about, uh, about 20 kilometres of, uh, of line. So for that first section, it took 18 months. And that's even before they actually start getting up the gorge itself, as you'd appreciate. From the word go, they provided um, trains, about two return services a day on the first section that was open. That was on four days a week ran from Cairns to the end of the contracted works, as they called it. The trains had stopped at the 8 Mile, which was later renamed Red Lynch, and uh, that was within a couple of weeks of its opening, if memory serves me correct. The original survey to the base of the range was through a place called Brinsmead Gap. There was a cheap, although there was a longer route that actually they surveyed, that went around Edge Hill outside of Cairns. They adopted that. And it's very simple, Lynette, why they adopted that. Finances, money and ease. So it might take you longer, but if it was going to cost less, and I think it was the, I even think at this stage, like they were realising the, the enormity of the work they were going to carry out to actually get that line up to uh, Coranda and eventually uh, hopefully up to Mareeba and Herbert and those places. The major section of the ascent of the Barren Gorge began with the awarding of Section 2 of the contract, and this was to John Robb. That was on the 26th of January 1887, and that cost 290000 984 pounds. So that's pretty big money for that era. And again, it's if you translate it into this day and age, different. I think, you know, you could be brave and saying we're you know, getting close to, you know, a couple of hundred million dollars worth of territory here. You know? Wow. So did they actually stick to that price or did they go up <laughs> and above? <laughs> yes. Um, it's a very interesting story with this one too. And uh, you know, quite often with contractors, if they couldn't deliver, and the time they were asked to do it or they contracted to do it, they had to pay penalties. And a lot of contracts, and I think even this one in Cairns Coranda, it went to arbitration. You know, between the Queensland government and contractors, they did on other lines for sure, which is basically because of what they said they do the work for, how much it eventually cost, you know, and uh, there were people out of pocket, well and truly. As I said, you know, it was uh, to, to do that second section, this is a really tough one and probably the one that people find, you know, almost like some of the icon. So John Robb, he took over and he was an experienced railway contractor and that's where they're fortunate. And the interesting thing was, in common with the beginning of the railway in southern Queensland, they brought in a workforce from overseas. Now, this one was very interesting because it's the 1890s and they brought in about 1,500 workers to undertake the works, They're mainly Irish and Italians. And Italians are very interesting because they were deemed, there was a prevailing thought at that stage um, that Europeans couldn't labour in the tropics, okay? It was unhealthy and everything like that. But to con undertake the construction work, they actually actively recruited Italians because it was felt Italians, although Europeans, you know, given from... Um, uh, giving a different climate and things like that, that they'd be able to adjust to, to you know, the rigours of tropical life there, which is 
pretty interesting when you think about it. coming from Italy. I don't know how many rainforests and things like that are in Italy, but uh, they were deemed actually to be um, a better workforce. But they also recruit the Irish again as well. I know, definitely not built for the tropics. <laughs> well, that's exactly right, you know. But the Italians, they're a, they're a tough breed. There's no two way about it. People were amazed at, you know, their abilities to work and things like that. Again, it was that entire contracted workforce, you know, that they had to bring in to undertake these works, you know. And, you know, it's an investment because if you're bringing people halfway around the world and actively recruiting them, it's a major investment for you, you know, in the works and everything like that, you know, that you're taking. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an enormous project when you think about how they're going to put it all together. Sorry, quick yeah. quick question again. Sorry. Yeah, please. Um, so they brought in 1,500 workers, and I know we are talking about 20 years later, but could none of the workers that were brought in for the original section down in Brisbane be transferred up? They were all skilled mi migrant workers. Well, they were, but you see, the, because they were actually, you know, skilled, um, you know, a lot of those, you've got to think about... You know, when they were navving, you know, 20, 30 years before, a lot of them actually moved on. Um, quite a number of them remained in Queensland. They went on the land. Uh, numbers of them actually went to uh, the Queensland Railways. And a lot of them, there was a very mobile workforce in that area as well too. We think this day and age, uh, COVID aside, you know, we seem to think that, you know, it's a, it's a very mobile world. But they were able to move all around Australia, you know, in the 1890s and into the um, 1890s. And then in the 1870s, there was huge amounts of railway construction work going around Australia. And again, if you had those skills that were in demand, if you had been able to be prove your own railway works, you could go anywhere in the colonies of Australia or beyond. So the recruitment, and because this large-scale labouring enterprise, there's a lot of people, but it was the distance thing. So it's almost like you need to get your own workforce in to construct that work in that time period and they're dedicated entirely to the task at hand, I'd suppose you'd say. And that's that's why I went through the recruitment process, you know. It was obviously the thing too, there was an intention that, you know, the Italians would probably remain after the construction of the railway and then they become part of the uh, European settlement story of uh, that part of Queensland as well. And I think later on about the Italian cane farmers and uh, those people that, you know, left the, they've left such a strong uh, imprint in North Queensland. So, yeah, so that was, that was the uh, Irish and the Italian. I wonder. I would have loved to have been there to actually to seen you know what the what it was like and you know the various accents and comments and that going on. But there you go. A part of this major section included a long horseshoe curve in the track to allow the train to gradually gain height. Sean shares with us what this landmark is like and why it's a great photo opportunity for tourists today. It's a pretty hard pull out of Red Lynch with the train. So on your way up, we go up to a place called Horseshoe Bend. It is a horseshoe, it's a shape of horseshoe. So what we do is we slow down to 10k an hour and we go around so people get photos of the whole train all the way around. If you're at the front, you turn around and shoot the back. If you're at the back, obviously you photograph a video of the front. You know, there's been some funny things like, I remember one day we're going up in a train and I got on the radio and I told the onboard staff, I said, Look to your right hand side, there's a python lying there and it just finished swallowing a kangaroo. So obviously it couldn't slide away. So for three days, they kept pointing that out. All the tourists, they thought it was fantastic because the python couldn't move because it had this massive kangaroo in its stomach. So there's a long horseshoe curve. It's a 15 kilometre long railway line that then follows. And in 15 kilometres, you've got the 15 tunnels and that goes up to the gorge at the top of Barron Falls. It's located 317 metres above Red Lynch. Uh, and the old currency, that'd be what, around about 1,000 feet, I think, so, think like that. Now, interestingly, Annette, there were originally 19 tunnels that they originally planned, but they actually decided and opted, instead of building the 19 tunnels, four of those were going to be replaced by cuttings. Sorry, Greg, for all those out there who aren't familiar with railway terms, what is a cutting? <laughs> yeah, cutting. It's not obviously something that it's going to end up on the floor of the, uh, our podcast or anything like that. It's nothing from papers or anything, but uh, cuttings is uh, very much, um, well, engineering, it's your construction term. A cutting is basically an excavation, which is made during construction work. Uh, literally dug into a hillside or dug into um, um, a raised area of ground. And the cutting actually to spoil, as they call it, which is the material which is dug out the earth and that, um, a lot of the time it was removed and then it was used to make an embankment. So you remove spoil from one cutting, it's then transported and dumped and it's made to make an embankment. 
And the idea of that basically through the cutting and the embankment system is it maintains a fairly level line for you as well, which you need with a railway. And so, you know, it's maintaining some form of level ascent. So move spoil from cutting here, which is allowing the train to go through on a certain grade, on a certain level. Take that material. You've got a gully or something further up that you're not going to bridge. Put the uh, soil in there to make an embankment. And that's how you build the railway up as well. And that's where the cutting is uh, anyway. Although, if you're, if you're from Toowoomba, cuttings also mean, you know, orchids and things like that and flowers around coming up to spring and everything like that. Now, John Robb, as I said, a very interesting fellow when it came to contracting. So he built a two kilometre long branch line from Red Lynch uh, to the main construction camp at a place called Camarunga. Uh, and that's situated at the base of the range. And then there's a short distance from, if you stand today beside the Barren River. And the Barren River, you know, is the central story not only to the uh, story of the uh, Indigenous people of North Queensland, the uh, wonderful uh, Aboriginal stories of creation, but that Barren River, of course, you know, um, it's, it's also the way the railway followed, of course, you know, going up. So the railway, the river, they're very close together in the story. And uh, for John Robb, Camarunga actually became his headquarters. Um, he had his main office there. Uh, the remarkable thing is, Annette, when you have a look at it, I think there are about 13 pubs or hotels or shanties, but definitely 13 hotels that were there at Camarunga. So, you know, there's a big thirst by the navvies or the uh, workers on that line as well. So they obviously would have done a roaring trade as well. So wait a second. John Brobb gets to stay down in this nice cushy hotel with his 13 <laughs> pubs that he can choose where he wants to go. But the navvies are all camped up somewhere on this 40 to 50 degree angle mm. with damp, wet camps to live in. Oh, damp, wet. Torrential, thank you very much, <laughs> Torrential. I know it seems uh, hard for us, but um, whenever you build a railway, you know, like you had your base uh, in construction camp, and that was where all the, uh, basically all the bureaucratic side of things went, where all the administrative uh, work was carried out. That was where the headquarters were. Um, that's really the base work. John Robb, however, I mean, you know, the contractors in this period, they, they might have seen, they didn't exactly, you know, stay in a pub somewhere or a nice hotel. You know, they lived it rough. They used to go up the railway works. They'd be there every day. They'd be, you know, where the, where the labouring was going on and everything like that. But, yeah, but living under canvas, you know, in the, in the Barren Gorge and things like that. And, uh, yeah, it's certainly something um, yeah, in this day and age, I, I certainly wouldn't want to try it myself. But we mentioned about, about the landform before there, Annette. I mean, there's, there's no ways to um, change it. It was described as treacherous. Like the hillsides and that were treacherous. We've got a few places up in the range where the, the range actually climbs pretty strong. That's Sean Robluski, train driver and driver in charge of Cairns. We're very fortunate these days. We've got multi-units on the trains. We've got two locos on the trains. Years ago, we only ever had one, so it was pretty tricky. So you had to be careful you couldn't get stuck. Cranor range is 150. Uh, people that understand what gradients are, it's the how many feet you travel in a metre you know, going up. So yeah, uh, the Cran Range is quite steep, it's 150. Um, so there is a few places there, if you don't know what you're doing, you will get stuck. You get bogged, they call it bog. So what happens is the wheels start spinning and you don't go nowhere. So in the wet season, you've got to know where you're going and what you're doing. I remember an old driver said something to me once that really sticks in my mind. It's great driving the range, but the day you lose respect for that range is the day something's gonna go wrong. So I teach that when I teach new people, don't ever take it for granted because you don't know what's around the corner. It could be a landslide, it could be a mudslide, you don't know. The entire surface was covered with about, I think it was about 4.6 million or 7.60 million layers of disjointed rock. There was rotting vegetation, there was mould, there was soil, there was fallen trees, you know, the whole box and dice, you know. So it's a volume of just over 2.3 million cubic metres of earth flokes had to be removed. And when it came to removing that, most of it was done by hand. So yeah, so working conditions and swamps and jungles, well, people described them as unbearable and things like that. Well, you know, people in that era, you know, whenever they were undertaking the works, it was tough. But that's how life was, you know, 120 years ago, 130 years ago. It was, you know, it was fairly difficult, the works that had to be undertaken. We mentioned before about sickness, and that came with the with the um, fact they were working in a tropical environment. It was also you know, they were uh, European stock as well. You know that would have been an absolute challenge for them as well. But uh, there were small townships, and if you look at the photographs that uh, were taken that document the construction work, you can see the small townships that were built up along the railway works. 
They were small townships. There was one at Tunnel Number 3, Stony Creek, where the bridge is, Glacier Rock. There was the Camp Oven Creek and there was Rainbow Creek as well. And the KSR people, there's got a lovely line. And I, I really like what they said because they said, the navvies tackled the jungle and mountains with strategy, fortitude, hand tools, dynamite, buckets and bare hands. And to me, I mean, that speaks volumes, literally, you know, just about the, you know, the, the working conditions. They had to literally remove, you know, parts of the hillside and remove it by hand and then by, you know, by spoil and things like that. And then by trains, you know, to take, con- they had to bring things up the range. You think about, they had to bring girders up, they had to bring sleepers and rails and things like that. Same point, they have to remove a lot of, you know, the, the soil, the material from the hillsides. Every loose rock and overhanging tree, well, it had to be cut by hand. It was during that type of work that the first fatal accident occurred, and that was a place called Beard's Cutting. A man named, I think it was Gavin Hamilton, he stood on the wrong side of a log that was being rolled into a fire and got killed. And those who died on the works, they were documented. In that era, I know there's this thing, I think, unfortunately, from, from the American Wild West and things like that, about railways and people dying and never been noticed. It was different here in Queensland and Australia. Again, if you're a contractor and you're undertaking the works and someone dies or gets injured, there are questions that could have been of compensation, but also the fact they always had inquests into a person who died, you know, whether through illness or through accident. So that's why they got a fairly good and pretty reasonable understanding of how many people died in association with the railway works. And um, and that was with, as a historian, those inquests, when they were written up, they are gold in their own way. They give you a wonderful insight, especially if you're a social historian, into the conditions that people lived in, the conditions they were employed under, and the difficulties that they had to deal with on a daily basis. And it's all there verbatim, you know. So it's... um, it is quite remarkable, you know. So that was uh, Gavin Hamilton. That's why we know that, you know, according to the records, that he was um, the first one who died. Officially, um, from the records, it's about 32 died whilst working on the railway. Um, that was mainly through accidents. There was malaria. Um, as in common with a lot of the Navy camps, there was brawling, brought on by possibly drink and things like that. Snake bite. Now, snake bite was another large, was another one that uh, you see lots of references to, um, which is... When you look at other places in Queensland, people did get snake bite, but again, it seemed to be in the tropical environment, the rainforest environment. You know, um, being bitten by snakes was um, another one of these unique features. And uh, there was also the mishandling of explosives as well, because they're working with dynamite at that stage. And working with dynamite, if you weren't fully proficient, as they say, it could end in disaster if you weren't aware of uh, what you were doing. And so there were those cases. The handmade tunnels and bridges of the Coranda Line are a testament to all of the navvies who work so hard to create this piece of the railway. And someone who sees and values their work firsthand every day is Cairns driver in charge, Sean Robluski. Well, I, I, I take my hat off to them, them old people because most of them are migrants and they were just coming here just to get work. So they got offered money to do a job. It wasn't the best of jobs. I mean, they had the conditions of terrible and they're going through rainforest which is as thick as thick and that's something else you see when you travel on the train when you're going up there you're going through thick thick rainforest and you hear the birds and everything you know it's just absolutely beautiful so them poor people have done that track oh mate i take my hat off to them because there's no way could i do, ever do that in my lifetime i can reassure you that hard yards We'll hit pause on our deep dive into the KSR there for now. The second part of our Coranda Scenic Railway episode will cover how the KSR was completed and how it became an international tourist attraction. Thank you to everyone who has left a review, a comment or sent in a question on our social media channels. We really love hearing from you. Our first question comes from at NoodleWalkTost on Instagram. Noodle asked, can you cover why Queensland Rail ended up with narrow gauge? Greg, can you please answer Noodle's question? Oh, that's a very interesting one, Annette, but um, unfortunately there's even been a PhD or two, I think, written about that topic. Um, Tim Fisher, when he was alive, he used to ask a lot of the same questions. We'd have talks about the narrow gauge. It is a bit of an involved topic as well. We did cover it briefly in um, our first episode, of course, Uh, but I'd say for uh, uh, Noodle, uh, it might be worthwhile to go back and then have a listen to it. 
it does go back to the time of Abram him Fitzgibbon who brought up the um, three foot six gauge, you know, and it had been trialled in Norway, then India, and uh, New Zealand as well. And there is a very good um, article, a journal article written in 1983, the Royal Historical Society of Queensland by the historian John Knowles, and it's about the adoption of the three foot six gauge in Queensland. That's available online if um, Noodle was interested to read that one because it really covers it off very well. And uh, but basically, I think the simplest message that came out from it, Annette, was it was a matter of the economy. We had to deliver the most service for the most for the smallest number of people, and it being a small population. And it goes back to that thing of Fitzgibbon, which was, you know, um, better to go 500 miles at 15 miles an hour than 215 miles at uh, 25 miles an hour. We've got another one here from Facebook from Ian Hayes. In the next podcast, will you be explaining how Queensland Rail came up with its vision of up and down direction and not following the UK, New South Wales, Victoria, WA or South Australia? and probably every other country, where up means towards a major city and down means away from the major city. Greg, can you enlighten us here? What does it mean? Well, up and down trains, yeah, again for Ian, it's a little bit of an involved uh, topic matter, but uh, the railway systems of the Australian states, they generally follow the practices of railways in the United Kingdom. So railway directions are described, of course, as up and down, with up being towards the major location or a town in most uh, states. It's usually the capital uh, city of the state. You know, for example, in New South Wales, trains running away from Sydney were down trains. In Victoria, trains running away from Melbourne are down trains. Um, an interstate train travelling from Sydney to Melbourne is a down train. But then we crossed the border at uh, Albury, it changed into a classification as an up train. And uh, even in states that follow this practice, exceptions exist for individual lines. So in the state of Queensland, up and down directions are individually defined for each line. Therefore, a train heading towards Roma Street is classed as an up train on some lines, but also as down trains on other lines. Whereas coming up to places like Toowoomba, that it's up, it's an up train to the country and down train to the city. It also gets a bit more complicated because our signalling, when we introduced it in the 1860s from England, that was on the left hand side, the fireman's side, not on the right hand side, which was the driver's side. And then, of course, the drivers and firemen on our locomotives, um, they were uh, followed the practice of the Great Western Railway in England. The drivers on the right hand side and the firemen's on the left, and there's yeah, other uh, colonies, and that was um, the reverse way around. It's uh, basically uh, the result of having very much an imported railway. And um, I think we mentioned in um, episode one there, the railway was very much the imported system, um, the, everything that came with it lock, stock, boiler barrel, rule books, everything. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit difficult to say, but uh, again, it's one of those things. And the shorthand thing in Queensland was up to the country and down to the city. Um, Adam Sedell at Kermist Cape has sent in, what are some of the oldest interesting artefacts you know, of Queensland you have discovered? I, I'd had to dis I really had to disappoint uh, Adam because um, I'm a historian and not an archaeologist and uh, as we know archaeology is far more interesting and well better portrayed. You only have to look at Indiana Jones of course for that. Um, recently down at Shorncliffe there's been an uh, archaeological project there where they've been looking under their station and finding all sorts of um, accumulation of items, you know, from the past uh, 100 or more years. Um, we were only talking up here in Toowoomba just before about after the floods in 2011 and uh, they came where some of the earlier railway works were dating back to the 1860s and they undertook a bit of archae arch um, an archaeological study just to see if they could uh, anything from the 1860s could be found. And there wasn't much evidence at all from the camps back then, of course. Um, they found a couple of old bottles, uh, ginger beer bottles, along the line, which could date back to that period because um, the old, um, they were uh, ceramic uh, pottery um, uh, bottles. And they, found some, they found some of those apparently at various locations. Uh, anything that's in the ground now uh, is actually uh, uh, is historical archaeology. So it's protected under uh, Queensland legislation. And so for myself, as a sort of historian, uh, it's not really archaeology. Um, you do get people asking, you know, asking, finding interesting things, or if they've got something in the garage that's been there for decades and wondering what it is. But um, one of the more interesting ones is um, North Ipswich Railway Workshops. It was in the 1980s, I think, and where part of the museum is now, they dug up the old boiler, f um, the boiler f uh, room floor, I think it was, or the the boiler shop, yeah, the boiler shop. 
and it was compacted earth because that's one of the best um, in, you know, absorbers of sound. Well, not sound, I should say, just vibrations in the um, boiler shop. But when they dug down, they found bits and pieces from steam locomotives that had been used as fill. They found bits and pieces of old smoke boxes. Um, I think it was off an A12 steam locomotive. They actually had what they called the builder's plates still attached to it. And the builder's plates is sort of like um, a birth certificate for a locomotive that's on the side when the, its works number where it was built. I think these were Baldwin's. And uh, they were dated back to the 1880s. So they're about, I remember that one from the 1980s and been told about that. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, archaeology that goes with the railway, historical archaeology. And uh, yeah, it's always interesting. I, and in my job, honestly, in it, some days I get questions or things get fired through to me. A photograph is something that literally someone has and, you know, I found this or this has come down to me, what is it sort of thing, you know, and it's a bit of a head-scratching exercise, you know. So, um, yeah, railways produced a lot of artefacts over the years and a lot of documentation and, uh, oh, well, I said, uh, as I said to one person only recently, it's not a case of um, who, what is it, it's more, I'm more interested sometimes how I got it because that's always its own fascinating story that goes with it too. So we have another question here from Jazz Raja. When was the first electric train launched in Queensland Rail? Electric services were inaugurated in the Brisbane Suburban System in November of 1979. And the first section that was inaugurated was between Corinda and Fernie Grove. Um, there was a big celebration in the lead up to that. Uh, there was a big pageant at Roma Street and they called it E-Day, Electrif e -Day, Electric Day, Electrification Day. Um, this is one of those historical things I can actually comment on and that because I was there. I remember it as a 13 year old and I remember seeing those first electric trains go through in November of 1979 from home as well. What happened was there were four electric emus, there were four emus in service and they were running, that was it, you know. And what people were doing, because you imagine, you know, as you know, November in Brisbane um, and you had the silver sets, you know, stainless steel with open windows and the old Evans cars, the wooden ones. So guess what was happening? It's air conditioned. It's November. <laughs> All the other trains are going through. Everybody's waiting for the electric train to get on for the air conditioning. That's what happened anyway. But uh, as I introduced more, you know, the, it, it, got, uh, it got much more, um, shall we say, civilised anyway. But yeah. um, they didn't run there. So they started off with four of them and uh, I don't think they even ran them on Sundays. You know, they still used to use rail motors, uh, you know, because there wasn't much in the way of passengers. In the second instalment of the Coranda Scenic Railway episode, we'll cover the completion of the railway and some of its key features. Surprise Creek is a creek that falls just above the power station. So when you look down, you're looking down nearly a thousand feet down, you can see the power station. It's a big drop. You know, if you've got vertigo, you don't look down there too much. We'll also find out how the KSR survived the downturn of two world wars and we'll chat to someone who's been involved with the KSR line for 27 years and find out how it became the popular tourist attraction it is today. This tourism product's been operating for that long, you know, in this small city of Cairns and pretty much Cairns City as we know it wouldn't be if this railway didn't actually commence. If you're interested in travelling up to Cairns and experiencing the Coranda Scenic Railway, head to queenslandrailtravel.com.au and book a journey. If you have any questions about our rail history, please message us on the Queensland Rail Instagram or Facebook accounts. You can also email the team at communitypartnerships at qr.com.au. We'd love to hear from you what you love about the podcast, what you'd like us to feature in the future. You've been listening to the Queensland Rail History Podcast, hosted by Greg and myself, Annette.